Hello, everyone. Jonathan Alexander here with the Los Angeles Review of Books. And I am really delighted to have today as my guest, Tori Peters. So Tori is the author of the novel Detransition Baby, published by Random House, and a book that was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction. She's also the author of the novellas Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones and The Masker. She's got an MFA from the University of Iowa and a master's in Comp Lit from Dartmouth. And she rides a pink motorcycle and splits her time right now between Brooklyn and an off-grid cabin in Vermont. So, Tori, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So I'm just going to go ahead and say that I, I, you know, not only is Detransition Baby one of the one of the sort of big news in, in, in queer and trans uh, fiction this past year. So if, if you haven't heard about this book, folks, then you've, you've definitely missed out. But I think it's also the book that many of us have, have been waiting for, um, a kind of, of book that doesn't pull many punches, that, that treats uh, uh, trans folk in particular, I don't want to say just like everybody else, because I think right. it's not exactly what you're up to. You know, if, if anything, the, the book has an interesting pedagogic function of really inviting people to think seriously about some of the complexities of, of trans life. But it really is one of the most sophisticated representations I think many of us have seen of queerness and of transness. And I just want to know, since the book came out in January earlier this year, 2021, what has this year been like for you, uh, experiencing not only the publication of this book, but all of the fanfare that it has justly received? It's been a really, it's been a really interesting year. Um, you know, I, I think the book, the trajectory of the book isn't one that I necessarily expected. I wrote this book thinking that it would be read largely by some queers in Brooklyn and you know, maybe it would have a little bit of a, a life cycle somewhere else. I mean, obviously like hoped for a lot of things, but um, but I think there's a moment when a book sort of, when it really separates from its author and that happened in this case around the, the Women's Prize when it was nominated for the Women's Prize and a lot of people, well, mostly like transphobic activists um, were upset that a trans woman was chosen for the Women's Prize. And suddenly then the book took on these narratives that were that I never intended for it. Like I never intended to argue with people in the UK about my womanhood. Um, and and then also then people came to defend it and that had sort of a life cycle and then suddenly it became this popular, like a bestseller in the UK and it was a woman's, you know, sort of a, bo a, a book club book for a little while, like in sort of, you know, especially in like women's book clubs. And then, you know, this fall suddenly I was like, this should be TV. And, and I was doing TV with it. And so um, there's been a way in which there's been the, the, the year that the book had, and then there's the year that I had, which was mostly sort of like watching the journeys of the book that was in some way separate from me. That's fascinating. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. You know, it, it reminds me that you have been writing about trans lives for some time. You've not always felt that the publishing industry is really open to hearing stories yeah. about, about trans women. And so you have been publishing sometimes in more underground or, you know, kind of, kind of uh, uh, indie, indie ways. So I can only imagine that the, the, the reception of this book and, and its popularity, its uptake for book clubs has been something of a surprise. So I have to ask you, since you said that you thought it might only be read by a few queers in Brooklyn, and also here in Los Angeles. Maybe may fly on a plane back and There forth. you go. <laughs> so what, 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 what inspired you? What, what was, if that's not too cliche of a question, what did you really want to do with this particular book? Because for those of you who are listening who haven't, who haven't read it, I mean, it's really a striking story about a complicated set of relationships between uh, two trans women, one of whom detransitions and becomes involved uh, with a woman. They are having a baby and invite Reese, the former trans woman lover, 
of the pre-transition trans woman, <laughs> pre pre detransition trans woman, to have a uh, sort of family, a queer form, a, a queer kind of family. Uh, it's it is an incredibly you know, deliciously complicated and sophisticated story. Why write that story? Well, first of all, I think you did a pretty good job summing it up. People still ask me to do like an elevator pitch for it in two sentences. And I'm like, uh, well, then they detransition. And then it's like, I want to have like a flow chart for it. I just but, wanted to um, say pre yeah. pre detransition. Yes. <laughs> <Great. laughs> but um, I mean, I, I, I wrote it for, I think, the reason that that I write most things, which is, it's funny, I'm writing for the first time prose since I've finish that book and I think the reason that I write something is usually that I'm trying to figure out something for myself mm -hmm. that I have a problem that is bothering me and fiction can be almost like a test case for how to live mm -hmm. and I think that that um you, know, you can kind of run an experiment on your characters to be like is this the way to live is this how you do it um but the in this case you know I was in my 30s and I was trying to figure out um I was in my mid thirties, like, what's next? How do I live? And I facetiously called it the sex in the city problem where there's, you know, for a cis woman, there's kind of the archetypes of that show as models for, you know, you can be an artist, you can have a career, you can have a baby, you can have a husband. And these are the ways that like women find meaning in their life, especially as they enter their thirties. And, um, and I was like, well, what does that look like for a trans woman? And, um, and I just decided I was going to choose the hardest of those problems, which is um, becoming a mother. I think it's the motherhood and, and trans women. There aren't a lot of models for it, although, you know, following, I think generation, generationally, um, you know, I wrote this book and suddenly yeah, there's all these trans women I know who are like, I'm trying to be a mom in like real life. I'm like, oh, I just wrote a book about it instead of trying to do it. Um, and, um, but it was it was <clears throat> taking on that really hard problem that I could sort of loop in all these other things about my life that I was trying to figure out, like relationships and about like how to tell tell myself the truth and shed coping mechanisms and be honest about sexuality um, that were all I could sort of all pile in on this question of of motherhood. Um, and so that was that was kind of what led me to to write it. And then, of course, once you're deep in a book, you you find that the characters decide that stuff instead of you. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think as I said, this is the book we've we've been waiting for. It's because just for what you're saying, for precisely what you've been articulating, is that this is not just a coming out narrative, right? This is this is not no. just a, a coming coming to terms. This is a we're deep into it. How yeah. do we make a life? How do we live? And what are those what are those moments in which people have to make decisions about what to do next when there isn't a clear roadmap? And I think that's what I love about the the contrast between Reese and Ames, uh, the two trans characters, and then Katrina, you know, who who is just now discovering heteronormativity, right, yeah. and, trying, and trying to figure that out. Um, the book also has, uh, I have to admit, one of the most brutal depictions of um, uh, uh, transphobic violence um, and very, very disturbing scene. Was that, I, I, I won't spoil it for people who haven't, who haven't read the book yet, uh, but it really, I think, shows some of the, the not just physical, but, but sort of psychological trauma that that trans people are are sometimes subject to and was that difficult to write i mean i understand it was important yeah. to include but was you're talking about this, the scene with stanley yes yeah um you know it's interesting that you say that because um i actually was sort of trying to subvert a little bit like the the ideas about transphobic violence that you get a lot of in a lot of trans media you get these moments where okay, a cis, a cis person is cruel and beats up a trans woman or something like that. And what I was kind of trying to do with that scene actually was to, to, to show the ways in which 
it can be more complicated than that. That that story is oftentimes somebody who's like an, you know, like an abject, you know, trans woman who's like beat up in a parking lot in like a, I don't know, a truck stop or something like yeah. that. Yeah. But in fact, you know, Ames is a Ames works as a as a in tech, you know, as a is like a is or, or Amy at that point works in tech and is is not you know, she's socioeconomically doing pretty well. And one of the things I was trying to do is basically like that fight, Amy starts that fight. Like if you think about it, like Amy was the one who, who chased Stanley down, Stanley and, and Reese down. Amy was the one who lost her temper. Amy was the one who threw the first punch. And so part of what I was trying to do is actually complicate a little bit people's feelings about like, the way that these narratives work, that we understand it as like, oh, the cis person always beat up the trans woman. But there's a way in which like, it can be horrible. Yeah. And that violence comes out of a kind of like history of, of like hating yourself and of frustration and of like microaggressions where they all come similar to a top, similar to a boil, I guess, could be the metaphor. But that in the actual moment, what you do can look completely outrageous, you know? So I actually think that, that it was Amy's bad behavior that led to the fight. Mm. The bad behavior was in fact, the result of transpho prior transphobia and the result looks immediately assimilated into a sort of typical transphobic narrative, which Amy can then herself rely on to say, why did you detransition? because I had this transphobic attack without, and then can like elide both agency and responsibility. And to some degree, like with violence, you never lose the horribleness of violence, but there's a way in which I'm always interested in looking for the agency of trans women in those moments. So for instance, you know, there's the suicide uh, part with trans women and, and there's the stereotypes of trans women, you know, committing suicide. It was especially big in like, 2015, there were a bunch of big in the media. Um, but, it, and the ways in which that gets assumed into narrative so that when Reese goes into the ocean, the immediate narrative is, oh, this is a suicide. And in some ways, and of course, you know, not to give it away, but it's not. And, and so there's ways in which these moments of violence or these moments of suicide for me are, are moments of like oblique humor ob and, and, and places where you can point out, well, why does this happen? Is it happening because the narratives are all true and, and trans women are constantly beat up and sad all the time? Or are we actually like agents in our own life? And, and for me, the, the book is about being an agent in your own life, even if you're a trans woman, making hard decisions, making plans, knowing that when you make decisions, certain doors are going to shut and being okay with that. And, um, and, and that even in moments that look like terrible violence, there's there's the possibility for finding uncommon stories and agents. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for un unpacking that 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 scene in particular because it's it's one of the ones which really I think exemplifies what you do in this book so well, which is take what seems to be a narrative we already know <laughs> and show yeah. that maybe we don't know this as well as we think we do. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, and what I think was particularly powerful for me is the, the slur that you have yeah. uh, Stanley use. He doesn't use a, a transphobic slur. He calls uh, Amy and Reese faggots. Yeah. Which I think is so interesting. And um speaks to the density uh, you know, of interconnected transphobia, homophobia, just sex phobia. You know, yeah, in, in and you know, powerful ways. Yeah. sorry to cut you off before no your question, but I think it's true. I think that so much of, you know, what you talk about is transphobia or, or is oftentimes, or what one hears about is transphobia is, is oftentimes like layered in homophobia, you know, is layered in misogyny, is layered in, and, you know, and the ways that the homophobia and misogyny go together and like all of these things. So that when people do are upset, they don't actually even know the right insults. You know, it's like we're living in a world of, of just sort of like jumbled aggression and that that itself can also be really re revealing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I love that you talk a little uh, a little bit about agency and the importance of agency for these characters. Um, this is definitely a book about people uh, 
trying to work things out, um, having desires. One of my one of my favorite passages uh, is when Reese is sort of reflecting on on what she wants, and she says, "Let that hunger for a family, for a child." for others to make a place in their lives for her, quiet itself a spell in anticipation of a coming satiation. This is a lovely, lovely line. You've got in, in uh, set off by dashes, those hungers for a family, for a child, for others to make a place in their lives for her. And what's lovely about the question of agency is that none of those are necessarily things that one can just make on their own. They're always in negotiation with others. And your character spent a lot of time talking through, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna make this work? Um, I'm just curious, what, how does one research that? <laughs> how, do, how, do you, how do you imagine those yeah. conversations? What in your life gives you the, the, the capacity for imagining those, those negotiations? Well, I think that I'm interested in those negotiations, especially where they bring up um, the difference between sort of politics and desire, you know? So like, so for instance, um, for Reese, like sometimes what she wanted with, with her relationships with like, a, I think especially men is she wanted a version in of life in which a man would take care of her, for instance, and that she could be sort of a woman, like in, in the mold that she grew up on with like, you know, sort of like a nuclear family. And that's, that's the way she grew up. And yet that was so at odds with the sort of like politics of her group of people and of the actual possibilities that were open to her. And, and that those politics she also knew were a little bit like regressive. Like, no, sorry, her desires were in some ways regressive. Mm. And so I think that, like, there's a, there's a thing that happens where we want things from people or we want a place and we want, we have desires and those desires are, are contingent on other people. And so we have to sort of, like, use a bunch of different things in order to sort of play out those desires. Some are sort of ideas of politics, like, you should do this, like, way of making life with me. Or this is the ethical way to behave. And some are like just charisma. Some are like, you know, like uh, sexuality, like all these different things. And it becomes this sort of like you throw everything at, at a desire. And then it, it, this isn't the most articulate way of explaining it, but like it sort of sifts through. And I think that's the way that like, the way that I solve this is that I mean, a lot of people think I really wanted to be a mother and, and I didn't like, I, that's not my actual desire that much, but it was like motherhood was a way of me understanding other desires that I had, you know, it was like, it became a, a, by analogy, I could understand my other desires by sort of figuring out motherhood. And so I did the motherhood in a theoretical way, the same way that I do everything, which is sort of like, I throw I throw all these things at it. I throw, for instance, you know, I threw Reese's resentment at the idea that Katrina would get an abortion and the ways that that set her up as like in a kind of conservative position as a trans woman. And I think about that as analogous to, for instance, even something like getting, um, let's say, let's say getting cosmetic surgery, you know, or feminizing surgery, where there's a part of me that's like, well, I want that. And then there's another part of me that's like, well, why should I want a sort of stereotypical idea of beauty? Shouldn't my politics override mm -hmm. like my ideas of this? But yet that desire persists and these things are messy and they sit in tension with each other. Yeah. And I think that um, like the way that I think is, is that I, I sort of just feel for those moments of tension and discomfort and uh, when I find com discomfort and tension between politics, between desire, between like the logistics of living, I usually find that that's a fruitful place, even if it's not necessarily my particular desire. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, I, I really appreciate you talking about it that way because the book really does introduce, I think, 
a, a, a readership to how people are trying to navigate the, some of those tensions between what it is that they want and how they're trying to live, what they imagine is the right way to live, the politically yeah. correct way to live. So I guess my, my second to last question along those lines would be, did you imagine a predominantly trans and queer readership or were you also thinking about people who might be new to these worlds and who might not have had much experience of them? The answer to that is like, is a little, is that my, my ideas changed as I wrote it. So when I first began writing, I imagined only a trans audience and, and I wasn't even necessarily related to this particular story, but to where I was in my writing. When I self-published, I was self-publishing specifically these books that I was like, I think of a trans audience. I think of the possibilities that are available when a, when a trans woman writes directly to another trans woman. And then over the period of time in which I wrote this novel, my own ideas about the sort of liberatory possibilities of writing to other trans women and the sort of artistic and aesthetic possibilities that happen when you write to other trans women began to change. Mm -hmm. Like I sort of began writing with this idea that like there was a sort of sisterhood of trans women that we would all understand each other and that if I wrote in a certain way, like it would set the bar higher because because we'd all have a, a common amount of knowledge. And then as I as I began to, you know, more and more time with trans women, I realized like actually there isn't necessarily always like a universal trans amount of knowledge or experience. Mm -hmm. That in fact we have very different experiences. And what I'm writing for is less based on a kind of identity, which is like, hey, I'm trans or whatever, and more of a certain sort of affinity where I was like, it's not all trans women that I share experiences with, but there's some who I share stuff with and I have this like strong sense of affinity with other trans women. And I'm writing to those trans women with whom I have affinity. Right. And then I don't know, I was probably two years into the novel when I began to think that affinity that I have with trans women, I think it also is true that I have that certain affinity with, with, with cis women, that, that the affinity that I feel or that I felt with those trans women I had thought was bounded by identity, but I think it actually transcends identity. And this was happening when I was reading a lot of books by divorced cis women, in which like the dedication is to divorced cis women, because I found that the trajectory of, of divorce for cis women felt a lot like the trajectory of transition and that you live your life a certain way. And then there's a break, a moment of break in which you have to start over and you can't get bitter and you can't reinvest in the illusions that brought you to that first break or failure. And so the questions that, you know, Elena Ferrante or Rachel Cosper, all these different writers were asking in their divorce books were similar to the questions that I was asking as a trans woman. And I began to think that like, oh, this affinity that I feel, maybe it's also an affinity that I have with cis women and maybe I widen my address slightly. And I speak in this broader way. I mean, and then I think that's actually why the book ended up being popular outside of, you know, a narrow band of queers is that I think a lot of different people ended up being, feeling addressed along lines of affinity, you know, like, and I think it's actually like, I think there's ways that like gay men felt addressed in certain ways that, because there's a certain affinity or that, you know, cis women in in in, mar in marriages felt addressed along lines of affinity, and then you can see people who are who are, you think would be like me, but who don't share that affinity and and don't feel addressed by that book. Um, I mean, and that's all. This question of affinity is one that I think is always. I, I didn't call it affinity I, when I first started writing, but you know, I in what I'm writing now. Um, I thought a lot about my my experiences um, before I transitioned, and um, and there's you know especially being closeted and and the ways in which you sort of like hook up or like move through the world. 
I think, pre-trans tipping point and somewhat closeted. And I'm finding all these affinities in my, in that experience with like sort of bathhouse culture, like gay bathhouse culture of that, that were before that. And uh, they, and it's interesting for me to like discover this affinity that I never would have, you know, because the sort of different gender directions happening, but um, you know, I, I'm thinking that in some of my next writing, there will be, uh, I'll be able to sort of include worlds that I never thought were mine in that affinity. Uh, just like the, the, the affinity with divorced cis women, you know, I, I'm not a divorced cis woman, but it ended up being a large part of how I understood myself. Um, so I think that's, that, that is, that emphasis on affinity was something that I found through the process of writing the novel. I love it. Thank you. It's beautiful to hear. So final question, is there a writer inspiring you right now? You already mentioned Ferrante and, and Cusk, yeah. great writers. Who, uh, who, who, is, who is turning your imagination on? Well, I, I'm going to list uh, actually a friend of mine, um, Jackie Yass, um, who wrote a book called Daryl, Daryl, it's not Daryl, Daryl, uh, about a cuckold in, um, in, in Portland. Mm -hmm. And um, Jackie is trans, but she's doing something that's similar to what I'm doing in that she sort of, instead of writing a trans story, um, she found a sort of a way of talking about ideas about sexuality and gender and about seeking. Uh, she found that in the story of a, of a, you know, a straight white cuckold and cuckold fetishist, not a cuckold just having been cuckold, but a cuckold fetishist, right. someone who looks for it, and his sort of like journey of, of self-knowledge. And, um, and I, it's, Jackie is a totally different writer than me, but it's really cool for me to have, to feel like I'm writing in a scene. And I think that like a lot of the best writing you know, in a, in a sort of trend. When I think about a lot of like the best writing that I love, um, sometimes it happens, it's just like a rare genius off on their own. But I think about like the modernists, you know, they were, that it wasn't just that they were a bunch of lone geniuses. It was that they were having conversations with each other and they were forcing each other to elevate. And, you know, Jackie, when I read Jackie's book, when I read um, Shola von Reinhardt's book, Lot, um, there's a, a, some other books by Chancey Paul, um, David, David Davis. Um, there are books that I feel like uh, they forced me to elevate or that we're rising together and that we're like our collective brain is able to push each other to places that we never would have gotten on our own. I love it. Thank you so much. I, I, I will put this book on my list right yeah. away. It sounds great. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a copy. Of, I normally have a copy of it right there, but it's, it's uh, Jackie, Daryl, just the name Daryl and Jackie S. E S S. Love it. I've been talking with Tori Peters, who is the author uh, most recently of Destination Baby. Tori, thank you so much for chatting with me. Thank you.